There we go. And we'll go full screen. And here we are. We're, like I told last night's class, I want to extend this, take the principles we learned last week in Taruma about the mistakes uh, that King Solomon made in the building of the temple as opposed to how the tabernacle was built, but also the importance of the acacia wood. And that's, what we, that's where we stopped last night, taking a look at the acacia tree as a possible candidate for the burning bush. And um, then we'll move in this class into the four fires of the Mishkan and how that would relate to the Merkava or the heavenly chariot. And when we say Merkava, I know it's got a highly mystical connotation, uh, but chariots are all through uh, scripture and you can hear the root word. If you think of it in terms of revelation, it talks about horses and horsemen. And in Revelation, it's horses who have riders. I think it's in Zephania where it talks about um, th they're driving chariots and the horses are similar. And so whether you're talking about a rider or whether you're talking about uh, somebody who's driving a chariot, you're working with the same Hebrew word and root, which is rakav. In fact, um, like if you go to the Rokevit in Jerusalem, you're going to the train station because that's what a train does. You ride on a train. It's kind of your chariot. And so uh, you don't have to worry really in Hebrew if you see something that involves a horseman versus something that involves someone driving a horse from a chariot. You don't have to try to distinguish between those because it's the same thing. And so when we start looking at the four fires of the Mishkan, we're going to relate them to the four horsemen of Revelation because that was our thing we did last night. I showed you how in the, in the back of workbook two, which is available now, uh, I set up the tour portions with blank spaces so you could make your own index and where you can look if you're trying to understand uh, the four horsemen of Revelation or whatever, you can go back to your index like Tetzaveh, like Bo, like Beha Alocha, and you'll find some of the same themes. So I gave you an example there of how the themes of one can direct you back to the other, and that way you can decode better what you're reading. Um, if you don't completely understand this passage, then go back to its matching passage and you should come away with more understanding. Um, let's see, we talked about light, um, and this is the beginning verses of the Torah portion, Tetzaveh, which is the commandment concerning bringing the oil. Uh, and it's interesting that it doesn't um, really say for the kindling of the lights, it says for the going up, ma'alot. So uh, sometimes a subtle word change can make you think in a, not a completely new direction, but an interesting new direction. Where as that flame goes up, as it ascends, and if, as Yeshua continually taught, we are to become that light, like he is the light, which is what lima'or is, or the root word of it means literally to become light or to become shining, to become that way. And so ma'or is going to be the means by which, and this is where you see the olive oil, it's going to be the means by which you become light or by which you become shining. And the action of it is going to be to go up. And again, it is it's taking us back to this resurrection picture. Significantly, he says from evening to morning. So that points us back to Genesis 1. We have to say, okay, where have I seen this phrase for the first time? I saw it continuously in Genesis chapter 1, evening and morning, evening and morning, evening and morning. And this was the first kindling or the first going up of the lights. 
we had a light day on day one, we had a light day on day four. So uh, we went over that last night. We looked at the Holy City in Revelation and how it corresponds to this Torah portion uh, where it's explaining or John is explaining to us that we no longer um, have to worry about this service of bringing the oil and dressing the lamps because we have become. That was the whole point of the pattern, to show us what to become. And so when you get to the holy city, you realize there's no need of the luminary, the ma'or, because the glory of Adonai is what's going to illuminate it. And when we walk in his commandments, the Torah is a light, the commandment is a lamp, then his glory is going to dwell in us, and it's going to be the means by which we can also become light. We're not the source of the light, he's the source of the light. Just like, yes, the sun has its own radiance, but it did not create itself. So it's simply doing what it was created to do, the moon likewise. It's reflecting the light of the sun, doing exactly what it was created to do. Right now, we cannot say that humankind is doing what it was created to do. We are not becoming light, as was the original plan in the garden. So, Okay, we're going to continue here. And the point on the fourth day, obviously, was it says, for the sake of the Moedim. The light is for the sake of the Moedim, just like Le Ma'or is for the sake of becoming light. And so we have... A we have a connection. <laughs> we have a connection between the fourth day of creation, where we have these luminaries for the sake of the Moedim. Then we have the fourth feast, which is Shavuot at Sinai, which is what we're interested in right now. Um, and that was the sign given, at, he, he was told at the burning bush, this is gonna be a sign, you are gonna come back and you are going to worship me on this mountain. And so our first mention of sign, obviously is gonna go back to the fourth day of creation. And on the fourth day of creation, it says that the luminaries were set in place for the sake of the Moedim. So you would know your calendar, you would know your appointed times. And so what happens, that sign is fulfilled. Moshe does take them back to the mountain. He takes them there for the receiving of the Torah at Shavuot, which is the fourth feast. And so everything is lining up perfectly for us in terms of our understanding, what does it take to become light? Well, part of it is knowing the calendar. It's knowing what the sun and the moon are for because if we are not becoming the light that we were created to be, it might be because we've lost a handle on the calendar and how that calendar retells the gospel every time we walk through it, every time we go through the feast, every time we go through a Shabbat, we can tell the complete message of our creation, of our salvation, of our redemption, of our uh, call to holiness and our call to service and so forth. And so the Moedim is part of this lamp uh, that we're going to talk about in the Torah portion. Okay. And just a, a recap on the, the acacia tree. Remember, the, it was a bush that was burning. And it's, it's a blazing fire. And this is where this angel was that's talking to Moshe. And the question is, um, it says he's talking to him in a blazing fire. That's going to be important because fiery beings are very much a part of the heavenly temple. And so the angel was in the fire. Maybe he was the fire. Maybe this, like we say, it's not a natural fire. So we too want to turn aside and say, what's the nature of this fire that Moshe saw that was so marvelous that 
the fire did not burn up the bush. And the bush is called a sne. And you can kind of hear Sinai a little bit. Um, but a sne just means a thorny bush. It doesn't mean a specific kind of thorny bush. And if you look at bushes in the Arava, they're mostly thorny. Right? So it's, it's not going to be a unique thing for it to be a thorn bush. It would be a unique thing probably if it wasn't a thorn bush. And I've got a great short video I'll show you maybe next week that I took of this big green bush out in the middle of the desert and it's just covered in bees. But you can absolutely see the thorns in there too. A bee would probably be the only one that would go to the trouble to work on that bush. Uh, but this is what he says. This is going to be a sign that it is I who have sent you. When you brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God at this mountain. And the mountain goes by two names, Horeb and Sinai. And both of those names are going to mean something to us. And my question was, what if the pattern Moses saw that he is copying and designing the, the Mishkan, what if it wasn't only while he was up on the mountain? What if it was actually in this burning bush itself? He saw something in this burning bush that he remembered that's going to be part of this pattern. Basically, a fire that does not consume but a fire that is part of a sign of something that will come at an appointed time. In this particular case, Shavuot, the giving of the Torah. So we know in the Mishkan that Moses designed, the, the wood product that is selected is called in English acacia. It's a type of mimosa tree. If you've ever seen a mimosa tree, you kind of know what a, an acacia looks like. Um, the leaves are definitely very similar. In Hebrew, it's shita or uh, shitim. And uh, even though a picture I showed you last week was of a pretty good sized tree, that's because it's irrigated, it's cared for. And that irrigation does more than water it, it kind of pushes away some of the salt content of the soil. Now, so even though the, the acacia can thrive in that salty soil, you push the saline part of it away with irrigation, it will thrive even more. The point is, and I took the picture of these acacia trees that are actually down in a wadi, which means they get more water than the average because that water is going to run through there during the rainy season. So they have a little bit more water to work with. Even at that, if you're in the mead bar, if you're in the wilderness, you're not going to get this nice, tall, beautiful, uh, large acacia tree like the biblical entry here is telling you. That's only if the tree is irrigated and in fertile soil. I'm showing you a picture of what Moses would have encountered since he went into the western mead bar. If he's starting in Midian, for him, the western Mead bar would probably be the Arava and the Negev. And I took this down in the Tzim Desert of the Arava. And you can see they're bush size. That's the average size. They're bushes. And they are thorny. They do have thorns. So I'm trying to make a connection here. Why would he need to work with this specific type of wood? Maybe it was already shown to him when he, he was on the mountain the first time. So yes, he gets the revelation on the mountain, but maybe he gets it sooner, or at least part of it sooner than we think he does, because he's dealing with a burning thorn bush. And as you can see, most of the bushes in this part of the desert are acacia trees. Um, and so the mountain where he goes and he encounters this acacia, uh, if it was an acacia, this bush, this thorny bush, it goes by Mount Horev, which means a desert, and it's another name for Mount Sinai. And this is going to be where they received the Torah. So it's significant. Where do you receive the Torah? You receive it in a desert place. You receive it in a desolate place. 
So you have come out of Egypt, basically out of Sheol, out of death, but you're not quite in the garden yet. It's not all angels and harps at this point. It's snakes and scorpions and sand and rocks. And he calls you to this specific place for specific reasons. The root of Chorev is Chorav. And again, it just means to be, to be dried up, to be desolate. But I want you to know, we, we've been going back to Genesis 1, Genesis 2, looking for these first mentioned phrases. And notice how the mead bar for the Israelites blocked the way to the land. They didn't go straight to the land. It blocked their way. So here's what it says. Um, basically, it, it, mankind is divorced because of the language that is used. In Hebrew, if you say grusha, that's a divorced woman. Grush is going to be a divorced man. And that's the language that describes how the man was driven out. He was driven out like a divorced spouse. It says at the east of the Garden of Eden, he stationed the cherubim, no direct relation to the cherub or cherav we're talking about, but it's kind of a wordplay um, with sound. He says he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword. Now I know we've always, I have always seen the cherubim as holding the flaming sword. But that's not what the text literally says. The text says, yes, he put the cherubim there and the flaming sword. So there's an essence of the flaming sword that he wants to set apart from the cherubim, even though it is tied to the cherubim. And this is not a lesson you can do with people who are new to Torah because they're too busy separating things out and doing black and white up and down. But after you've studied a while, you can say, well, yeah, it's okay that both things can be true. But textually, there was a reason why he separates the flaming sword, the lehat cherev, from the cherubim. And this flaming sword, it says it turned every direction. And this is the exact description of the Merkava, the heavenly chariot. It can go in any of four directions without turning. And this is exactly what this flaming sword, this lehacherev, is doing. And the purpose of that is to guard the way to the tree of life. And so the point of this driving away was, look, I don't want him to eat from the tree of life and live in sin continually. Um, he can't pollute this garden continually. So he's driven out. We have now Israelites who have been released from death, who have been released from Egypt, but we can tell that they are by no means pure and holy. <laughs> they have issues in the wilderness. And so it's a good thing that he didn't take them straight into the land because it would have spit them right back out. Because the level of the land that he wanted them to go to, remember, is a, an elevated level not just the plain old rock and dirt level we see with the physical eyes. He wants to restore them to the garden. Of course, the golden calf ruined that. Then the spies ruined that. But that was the plan. That was the possibility of going to that elevated level. But what is going to stand between you and going back into the garden and dragging your uncleanness and your abominations back into the garden for which you got kicked out? There, he put something protective there so you wouldn't do that to yourself. And it's called a flaming sword. And so cherev, the flaming sword, is the same root as chorev, the mountain on which they received the Torah. So why did the, the Torah need to be received in the wilderness? Because it's going to stand as a barrier, but at the very same time, it's going to stand as a test. Basically, can you do two things? Can you serve me? Which is what Adam and Eve were supposed to be doing. They were supposed to be doing avodah, which you can translate as work or service. 
they were supposed to be servicing the garden. Number two, they were supposed to be guarding it. Two things, and I say only two things, but those two things are everything. When you think of everything that, that covers, that's not an easy thing. Even though it's only two, it's overwhelming. Because if you think, okay, I've received the Torah, and now I am supposed to be a type of priest with this Torah, I am supposed to do service in my daily life, and maintain a level of holiness in my daily life according to the words of this book. And I'm supposed to guard zealously the boundaries that he has established for me. And how well do I do from day to day or even from minute to minute? Because trust me, my day can change on a dime when I can't make two numbers add up on my income tax. <laughs> The holiness just goes down the drain for a second because I get frustrated. Well, you know what? I don't want to carry that stinky attitude into the garden. All right. I have a higher level of service. I have a higher level of holiness, of guarding the commandments so that if I, you know, I don't lose my temper so that I don't do something unholy. And so we make mistakes. And that's why in some sense, the wilderness is a blessing. Chorev is a blessing because it gives you the instructions and then it gives you the time in the wilderness to learn your service. And that's what Moses is doing them. He's teaching them the Mishkan service. Everybody, all Israel, not just the priests. He's teaching everybody the Mishkan service and he's teaching them how to guard their boundaries, even though they fail each time they're learning something about how the serpents get in and bite. And so, or how the plague can hit. When you make that mistake, it's better to make that mistake in the wilderness than to go into this elevated spiritual place where you're just not going to last. You're going to fall out. Right? The, the consequences... I can't imagine what they would be. If you tried to drag into the Garden of Eden all the uncleanness and abominations that cling to us just because of where we are in the exile, because of where we are in Babylon. And so this flaming sword is guarding the way back in, but at the very same time, he takes that tree of life and he puts it at Mount Horeb. He puts it out in the wilderness, kind of like a Mishkan. It's not the heavenly temple, but he takes some of that and he puts it in a form that the people can almost take. You know, Moses had to kind of be the mediary, but he says, I'm going to give it to you out here in the exile. I'm going to speak to you out here so that you can learn your lessons out here and I can test you to see what's in your heart. If your heart is good, then you're gonna be able to go into the land, my sister, my bride. Um, and you're going to be able to enjoy that. But you have to understand that there is a flaming sword guarding the way. And that's exactly how the spirit of Adonai works. It turns in every direction without actually turning. It can go in any direction. But the chariot's guarding the way. And I think this is where in the rabbinic commentaries, they're getting the language that when you cross over into the garden after death, that it's the heavenly chariots that transport you. What is that? It's the spirit of Adonai that's transporting you into the garden, which absolutely transforms so much of Yeshua's language when he talks about being the rivers of Eden and so forth. But these chariots or the chariot itself is what is going to transport you like it did Elijah. So when they come pick you up curbside, uh, you know, you want to be ready for that journey. So, is the wilderness one way of looking at the flaming sword, was my question. Is our experience out here in the Midbar, he's testing to see how we'll do with temptation, how we'll do with his commandments, so that we are prepared to go into the garden. And in that respect, Mount Chorev is like that flaming sword. 
It's guarding the return to the tree of life. And so this is why it makes a whole lot of sense, and it'll make more sense here after we get a few more slides forward, why the acacia tree would form the walls. What are they doing? They are guarding the Mishkan. Remember, they're not stacked. They have to stand up. And they stand in silver sockets. And silver in scripture represents redemption. So we are trees, we are boards, and our feet are in silver sockets of redemption. And we're side by side. No one board is taller than the other. There's an equality of service that was experienced in the Mishkan that obviously King Solomon didn't do so well with that whole idea. All right, so we've got Sinai, which also means thorny. So it's going to be kind of an equivalent expression um, to the sne or the burning bush. And then we're going to look at a concept of the seraphim, which are the fiery angels. There's cherubim, which are the close angels, but then there are seraphim, which are the fiery angels. In Matthew 4, 1, we get a hint as to this pattern that says, then, remember he's immersed by John the Baptist, and it says, then Yeshua was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Okay, that's the specific language in our Torah portion of the light of the menorah. It's supposed to go up. It, it comes from Allah. So it goes up. The spirit, the flame goes up. Yeshua is immersed in the Yarden, and at that point, the opposite happens of what we would expect. It says he's led up by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Right? So he's going to experience the same thing Israel did. They were in Egypt, and they came up from Egypt. They came up a spiritual level. They're experiencing supernatural food, water, uh, space, clothes, shoes. All of these are supernatural or semi-supernatural. So they've come up a spiritual level, even though they're in the wilderness. So from the wilderness, there is a temptation. There is, like, you know, Bamidbar, in the wilderness, it's a whole book of the Torah. How are you going to handle the Torah in the wilderness, in this in-between place? Because you're up, you have the Torah now. But the irony is, now that you have the Torah, you're in the wilderness. Well, how's that a treat? You know, <laughs> it's, it's not necessarily a treat, but it's a test. He says, okay, I'm going to give you the Torah. I'm going to see how you handle it. And basically, I'm going to see how you handle your brothers and sisters, which is going to tell me how you're handling my word. So you come up a level, he tests you there, and ultimately, he wants to bring you up again. He wants to bring you into the garden. So in the wilderness is where he's going to find out whether you'll do two things. Whether you will stand upright in his word and whether you will resume your guard duty over the testimony. Whether you will guard the tree of life in the wilderness. Because if you can guard the tree of life in the wilderness, if you can protect the testimony in the wilderness and take it into your heart, then he can trust you to enter back into the garden and maintain that level of being faithful to the tree of life and maintain that level of guarding the tree of life, the two things that are required in a garden. Now, one thing to remember, we've looked at this before, ancient writers such as Herodotus and uh, Esarhaddon, or Esarhaddon, the Assyrian king, um, they record that flying serpents were known to inhabit the wilderness in the Negev and the Arabah. Remember, it's along an ancient spice trail you know, I've shown you a ton of pictures from that area. I've even shown you the Scorpion's Ascent, where much of this area, these uh, wilderness events occurred. But 
these winged serpents would come out and attack along the border with Egypt. And the, the tablet, the Assyrian tablet, describes them as yellow snakes spreading wings. Right, so what do we know about one wilderness test that they failed? The result was, it says the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many of the people died. And I put the Hebrew on there so you could see that two words are put together. You've got hanach, uh, yeah, hanachshim, which is, a, here again, you've got a textual anomaly. So you've got the snakes, ha seraphim. Hmm. So are they the nachash snake? Or is it a seraph? Yes, he's putting the two things together. He wants you to understand the snakes in the context of the seraphim, which means fiery. So these aren't just normal uh, nachshim, not just normal snakes. These are fiery snakes. It's suggesting there's something supernatural about them. They're not entirely of this world. And when we're studying the horses of Avadan, we can see that their tails are not normal horse tails. They're serpents, and they have a sting like scorpions. They're fiery. And so we realize we're not really dealing with normal snakes at this point. These are a representation so that we won't forget what got us out of the garden the first time the snake. But when we look at the seraph, then we start thinking in heavenly terms. I mean, really high heavenly terms. We start thinking about the Merkava. We start thinking about the heavenly chariot when we see a word like seraph or seraphim. Because yes, even though they are fiery, poisonous serpents, they are only so to those who are in disobedience and rebellion. And so remember the serpent is like the scorpion, they're used for discipline. And so um, you can see how having them there in that wilderness, it's creating that barrier. Like if you can't deal with this snake, you're certainly not gonna go back in the garden because you won't be able to guard it. It's gonna still need to be guarded. You still have to know your job. So let's compare um, the seraphim because we're gonna get different visions of them. In Isaiah 6, one through four, it says, in the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe filling the temple. Okay, this is similar to what the elders saw on the mountain when they ate and they drank. They're, they're able to see some glimpses of this. It says, seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. So in this case, Isaiah sees six wings. <clears throat> and they, they, uh, the seraphim are going to resemble the cherubim in terms of how the, the wings worked on the ark. He says, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And then we compare this to what John saw in Revelation 4, 8. Move it so I can read it. It says, and the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. Right, that can be a little confusing. I'm not saying I've got this all worked out. Because remember, previously when we looked at the four living creatures, one of them was a karuv. It was the what we would call the fat blonde baby angel, which it isn't, but it's uh, and a karuv is a different class of angel. Isaiah is calling them seraphim. John is assigning to the four living creatures, of which we know a karuv was one, the same language, holy, holy, holy. 
And so there's some intersection here, you know, and that's okay. We can let that go for now. We're just trying to figure out how this heavenly chariot works in the Mishkan. And then we have Ezekiel 1. And I want to read this out of the Tanakh because I think the language is going to help us. And by the way, chashmal, um, which is going to describe the fire. Normally we say esh for fire. It's going to say chashmal. It's a different kind of fire. It's more like a lightning fire. The modern Hebrew word for electricity is chashmal because it moves very fast. So in Ezekiel 1 uh, through 3, he tells us that he's having this vision in exile. And I think that's going to account for some differences among Isaiah's account, Ezekiel's account, and John's account. It's going to be the, the time period in which they're experiencing the vision. And Ezekiel specifically prefaces this with saying, I was in exile when I saw this. So we want to think about that in terms of the prophecy versus John saying something that's futuristic. There might be some, some small differences. But in chapter, uh, verse 4, he says, I saw, behold, there was a stormy wind coming from the north, a great cloud with flashing fire and a brilliance surrounding it. And from its midst, like the color of the chashmal, from the midst of the fire, and in its midst, there was the likeness of for chayot. Now remember, one of the altar judgments is chaya, and it's singular wild beast. You've got sword, you've got famine, you've got plague, you've got wild beast. Those are considered the four altar judgment. So chaya, Think of the, the chariots. Sometimes they're Pharaoh's chariots, but then in the Song of the Sea, it's the horse and the rider. It's singular. So as he's saying, well, these are plural, the four living creatures, but there is also a plague of chaya, wild beast. Uh, this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man each one had four faces, and each one of them had four wings. See the difference here? We got four wings versus six with Yeshayahu. We're going to have a replacement here of hands for a set of wings. Their legs were a straight leg, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a rounded foot, and they glittered with the color of burnished copper. There were human hands under their wings on their four sides. Their faces and their wings were alike uh, on the four of them. Their wings were joined to one another, which makes you think of the Ark of the Covenant. They did not turn as they went. Each in the direction of its faces would they go. As for the likeness of their faces, there was a human face and a lion's face to the right for the four of them and an ox's face to the left for the four of them and an eagle's face for the four of them. As for their faces, their wings extended upward over them. For each face, two wings were joined to each other, and two wings were covering their bodies. Each in the direction of its faces would they go, toward wherever there was the spirit to go. That's where we can relate this to Yeshua being led of the spirit into the wilderness to be tested. Wherever there was the spirit to go, they would go. This also uh, describes the fire and the cloud over the Mishkan. Wherever it would go, the Israelites would go. When it would stop, they would stop. They did not turn as they went. As for the likeness of the Chayot, their appearance was like fiery coals burning like the appearance of torches. It spread about among the chayot. There was brilliance to the fire, and from the fire went forth lightning. And this is all describing very vividly the giving of the Torah, if you remember. The chayot ran to and fro like the appearance of a flash. I saw the chayot, and behold, one ofan, and ofan is a wheel. In modern Hebrew, if we say ofanaim, we say bicycle, wheels, <laughs> plural. 
but one is an ofan. One ofan was on the surface near each of the chayot by its four faces. The appearance of the ofanim and their nature were like the color of Tarshish with the same likeness for the four of them. And their appearance and their works were as if there would be a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they would go toward their four sides. They did not turn as they went. They had backs and they were tall and they were fearsome. Their backs were full of eyes surrounding the four of them. When the chayot would go, the ofanim would go next to them. And when the chayot were lifted from upon the surface, the ofanim were lifted. Toward wherever there was the spirit to go, they would go, for there was the spirit to go. The ofanim were lifted facing them, for the spirit in the chaya, okay, here it's shifting back to a singular. We've gone from chayot, which is plural, now he's calling all four of them one being, Chaya, which remember is the, the fourth altar judgment, Chaya, well beast. For the spirit in the Chaya was also in the Ofanim, in the wheels. When the Chayot would go, the Ofanim would go. And when they halted, they halted. And when they were lifted from upon the surface, the Ofanim were lifted facing them. For the spirit in the Chaya was also in the ofanim, in the wheels. So I want you to just visualize the rivers of Eden, the wheels within the wheels of the rivers of Eden. There was a likeness of an expanse above the heads of the chaya, switches back to singular, like the color of the awesome ice spread out over their heads from above. And beneath the expanse, their wings were even with one another. For each of them, two wings covered them, and for each of them, two covered them, their bodies. I heard the sound of their wings like the sound of great waters. The sound of many waters. John speaks of this. I heard the sound of the voice was like the sound of many waters. Yeshua had already identified himself as those rivers of Eden when he stood up at Sukkot, when he stood up at a designated time, a moed. That's why these moedim are important. He says, it's like the sound of Shaddai. As they moved, the sound of a commotion, like the sound of a camp, when they would halt, they would release their wings. There was a voice from above the expanse that was over their heads. When they would halt, they would release their wings. Above the expanse that was over their heads was the appearance of sapphire stone in the likeness of a throne. Remember, this is exactly what they see on Chorev. They see the sapphire brickwork. Uh, also remember tradition tells us that the first set of commandments was given on sapphire stone. So the sapphire stone is associated with the throne itself. Now remember it says, uh, what is it? Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. So basically what Moses was given was a piece of the throne, the heavenly throne, which is pretty astounding. What was on that sapphire stone? The foundation of the very throne of Shaddai, according to Ezekiel. And upon the likeness of the throne, there was a likeness like the appearance of a man upon it from above. And I saw the color of chashmal, like the appearance of fire inside it all around from the appearance of his loins and upward. And from the appearance of his loins and downward, I saw something like the appearance of fire and a brilliance surrounding it. This is what we're interested in when it comes to the Mishkan, because we're gonna to get to the four colors of fire in the Mishkan. Maybe this is where the Midrash is getting these, these four colors of fire. I don't know how they came up with the specific colors, but they're spot on with what John describes. It says, like the appearance of a bow that would be in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the appearance of the brilliance all around. That was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Hashem. When I saw, I fell up on my face and I heard a voice speaking. So that's a lot of information, 
but it really helps us. I'll stop sharing for just a second so you can see this better. You're used to seeing this menorah, right? And then we've got our graphics we've been looking at, but one thing we haven't figured out how to do with the graphic is how to make the wheels turn. Right, so if you can envision those rivers of Eden, and we know that the rivers of water were also fire. That's what Shemaim is, it's water and it's fire. And so when you're describing these rivers of Eden and how they circled or encircled, protected the garden, especially the tree of life in the midst of it, if we were actually living within the wheels, the Ophanim of the heavenly chariot in the Garden of Eden, and we know that there's fiery coals in here. If you're living in a state of abomination, if you don't know how to guard the garden, you're not going to survive in these wheels because these wheels go anywhere the Spirit says. If we're not willing to go anywhere the Spirit says, we're gonna have a hard time keeping up. In fact, I can see these wheels would just completely destroy you because if they wanna go any direction with these wheels, they can go in any direction without turning. And there's even a message there because at this point, a lot of times when we need to change direction, it's because we need to repent. We've been headed in the wrong direction, and he actually has to turn us around to get us headed in the right direction. But wouldn't you love it if the Spirit spoke to you, and you didn't even have to turn? You just went. You just, like it said, like lightning, you could go that fast to perform his will, to do his service. So it's not a matter of, oh, let me repent and turn around and do it the right way. You have become light. You have done exactly what that luminary is supposed to do. You have become light. And so you're going to be right at home in the New Jerusalem. If, if you can do it in the exile, if you can do it in the wilderness, then you're going to be able to do it in the garden. Okay, so I'm going to share again. Okay, so we've got this necessary transition because the mead bar blocks the way to the garden. And this is what um, Rabbi Khan wrote, and I thought this is awesome. This is worth putting on your Facebook page. You know, I'm not a big quotation poster, but if I were going to post a quotation on Facebook, I might do it. This is a great way of looking at what happens in the wilderness. Rabbi Khan says, the objective of the Exodus is not merely geographical. Neither is it to merely leave Egypt, nor simply to go to Israel. The objective is to serve God. And I saw a little bit of that on this trip, this last trip to Israel. For some people, it seemed like the whole point was just to go to the land of Israel, the physical land of Israel. But going to Israel, there's such a high standard. If you're, if you're going to experience everything that you should be experiencing, you're not simply going on a trip or vacation or a volunteer excursion to Israel. It's not geographical. It's not a matter of getting out of the country you're in or just getting out of Babylon. No matter where you are, in Babylon, in Israel, in Egypt, the objective is to serve God. Avodah, it goes back to the garden. Work the garden and guard the garden. So that's what we have to be willing to do, to guard and to work in the garden. And it is better to learn these lessons in the exile. It is better to learn them in the Midbar, to be tested so that when we do cross into the garden, we'll be much more at home there and much more ready to serve. How can we serve if we haven't had a good work record? 
You know, when you apply for a new job, they go back and they look at your work record. And if you haven't worked anywhere before, you're going to have a hard time finding a good job. How can they trust you if there's nothing to go on? Or if you've left every job after six months and it was always someone else's fault, it may not be somebody else's fault. It might be that you have issues. So how is he going to promote you into this important job if you have no work record to assign you? And I, I do think in that sense, we're all equal in the kingdom when it comes to like the standing boards. But there's also parables of responsibility. You know, were you a standing board or were you a fallen board? <laughs> were you a board that cracked? Are you a board that let go of the other boards on either side of you? Even the boards had responsibility with one another. Okay, so that's another graphic. So you can just refresh yourself on those spirits like Ezekiel is describing the spirit of Adonai. Wherever the spirit would go, the wheels would go. The chariot would go. We're calling it a chariot. It's a vehicle. The vehicle would go. Um, let's see, we've talked about how Ezekiel is seeing, instead of a third set of wings, he sees a set of human hands. I think that's because of his position in the exile of Babylon. And what John sees, I think, is a restoration to what Isaiah was seeing. Um, they would have the six wings. Um, because he's envisioning a time of return from Babylon. Those who would escape Babylon, the great, that is destined to fall, fall. In other words, they can't stay in the garden. They're going to fall. Um, so John is seeing more than just salvation. John is really envisioning a return to holiness. Because if you look at the messages to the seven assemblies, it's not about salvation at all. That whole message is about holiness, and it's associated with Babylon, not Egypt. You get out of Egypt by salvation from death. You get out of Babylon by returning to holiness. So here's just some recaps from last week that what makes something holy is the fact that we have set aside our own will and that's where heaven's will reigns. It's a domain wholly set aside for 100% obedience to him. And you can take that element of holiness anywhere on earth. You can be 100% obedient to him no matter where you go. In that sense, you are a little temple. You are a little mishkan. But the Jews had to kind of be weaned around having one central location when they were exiled to Babylon. Okay. Um, and we looked at that. How can we sing the songs of the Lord in a strange land by the rivers of Babylon? Um, in spite of all their idolatry, the Jews were still tied to the temple for the Moedim. And so um, we know that the Euphrates, the Tigris, they're also named as rivers of Eden. So it was a reminder of them of their lowered spiritual condition. Um, but in Babylon, again, it's a return to holiness. I'm going to skip ahead here a little bit. All right, so we know that we're in a type of exile. We don't have a temple. But we are little Mishkan. We're a, we're a little bit, you know, a little tiny one out in Babylon. And remember, this is where the prototype of the synagogue sprang up. They said, you know what, doesn't matter where we are, there's still some things we can do. Like in the wilderness, they brought the voluntary gifts to build the Mishkan. We can still do that. We can still assemble ourselves together, especially at the times of the Moedim. Because if you don't gather, by definition, you're not observing a Moed. A Moedim has to be a gathering of people. 
Uh, and when you start, you might be a gathering of one. If there's nobody else around who wants to gather at that appointed time, but he has stuck us in so many dis, you know, I want to say dislocations <laughs> around the world, but they're not really dislocations. They're exactly what he said. I'm going to send you out into the world with this message. So you might start out being a lamp of one. You might start out being that one little acacia tree stuck out in the middle of the desert. But if you will be faithful there, if you will keep his commandments there to the best of your ability, if you will guard your Shabbat, then you will begin to find other little trees. You will find other people to stand with. And just remember, there's a shelf life to your exile. You won't be out in the desert forever. You're there for preparation, not for just wandering around trying to get from one day to the next. That's what that's what the serpent wants to do. He wants to so completely occupy your time and so completely discourage you that you will ever find like kind and like mine. That it's easy to just kind of go back into the, the mundane activities and all of a sudden your, your guard will be let down in terms of Shabbat. That, that great joy, that first love that you experienced when he brought you out into the wilderness to speak to you. And you'll get so tired of fighting and saying, I'm the only acacia tree out here, that it would be easy to let your guard down on Shabbat. But there's a reason why we shouldn't. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit of this because we did this last week. But remember, when he said, let there be light, the rabbis say there was an interruption. And this is a resumption. And so we see a continuous pattern of this. Light will come into the world. And of course, the great light of Yeshua came into the world, and then there was an interruption. We received a light of the Torah, and then there can be interruptions in our journey. There can be slowdowns, there can be turnarounds, but hopefully there will be resumptions to where, again, we may have to turn to repent. Um, but nevertheless, the plan will go on. There will be a resumption of the light, no matter how many interruptions in the plan there are. So the whole point of the light is for there to be light, just as at the creation, and for there to be no interruptions so that we don't have to restart. Like, okay, we got kicked out of the garden. How are we going to fix that? We're going to make a mishkan in the wilderness. We know we can't be in the garden right now, but we can make a mishkan in the wilderness. So what we really have to learn out here about being alone in the wilderness is I need to learn holiness and I need to guard my borders. I need to guard this mishkan. And because the presence dwelled in the people, remember it dwelled in the people who built the mishkan, that means I must protect my people too. And Yeshua constantly talked about this light in the Gospel of John, by the way. So last week, we looked at several points where King Shlomo stumbled in building the temple. He forgot the lessons of the Mishkan, and he forced the labor. He intermarried with the Egyptians and, and the royalty of foreign lands. He started buying chariots and horses. Um, but there's a, a little bit different problem. Of course, this, this led to the, the splitting of the kingdom. And eventually, it led to Israel going into exile with Assyria. It led to the Jews going into exile in Babylon. So when Ezra and Nehemiah come back from Babylon, we're going to see a replay of something where we saw Pharaoh basically trying to rerun Shlomo trying to rerun Pharaoh in terms of mistakes. Now we're going to see the average Israelite or the average Jew who comes back from the exile doing the same thing. It's unreal what we don't learn from scripture and how smug we can be when we read about their mistakes. And at the very same time, we're doing those same mistakes. But remember, Moses warned him, said, when we build this temple, it's not going to be every man doing what is right in his own eyes. Right? But that's exactly what had happened when they came back from Babylon. 
we can read in Nehemiah, is it? Definitely not Job. Yeah, it's in Nehemiah, um, chapter 13. Some problems here, not just the big problem, chapter 15 um, through 22 details how that they were working on Shabbat, carrying burdens on Shabbat, and buying and selling on Shabbat. And here's what Nehemiah had to do. Um, it happened when the gates of Jerusalem cast shadows before the Shabbat that I spoke the order and the doors were closed. And I spoke the order not to open them until after the Sabbath. I stationed some of my servants at the gates so that no burden could come in on the Sabbath. So the merchants and the sellers of every merchandise lodged outside Jerusalem once and then a second time. I warned them and said to them, why do you lodge across from the wall? If you repeat this, I will send a force against you. From that time onward, they did not come on the Sabbath. Talk about guarding your walls there. Then I told the Levites that they should regularly purify themselves and come as guards of the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. This too, remember for me, O oh my God, and be compassionate toward me according to your abundant kindness. So coming out of the exile, we might come in with some bad habits. And one of those bad habits is thinking that it's okay to keep working on Shabbat, thinking that it's okay to conduct commercial activity on Shabbat. And for those who were prepared, Nehemiah takes from the Levites, and what are they supposed to do? One, purify themselves, holiness, and number two, guard the gate of Shabbat. So what is our lesson to learn in Babylon, our lesson in the exile? Purify yourself and guard the gate on Shabbat. Guard it. Don't let anyone in. But also the mistakes they were making, if, if we keep reading here, they had married foreign wives. Exactly what Solomon did. He started marrying foreign wives. Uh, they started basically taking Hebrew slaves, loaning money to the poor, then knowing they had no way to repay it, and then taking them as forced labor, just like King Shlomo. And so the Jews who returned basically became little Shlomos, you know, and it involved carrying commercial burdens on Shabbat, but the idea of the carriers, you know, that's what we have to watch out for, carrying that burden. Um, we had that last week, I think. But you can see the, the same points that we've got in here between Pharaoh and King Shlomo. You can go over, you can make an additional column here, and you can add the little Shlomos, the Jews who returned from Babylon, and the mistakes they made. All right, so still, exile has not taught us the lesson. Um, Okay, let's look at this right quick to wrap up this Merkava deal. Exodus 25, 8 through 9 says, Let them construct a sanctuary for me, that I may dwell among them, according to all that I am going to show you as the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furniture, just so you shall construct it. So our commentary, the Sephorno commentary to these verses says, I will dwell among them to accept their prayers and service in the same fashion that I reveal my Shekhinah on the mountain, on the kaporet between the two Kerubim, with the model of the Mishkan and the model of all the utensils. For the form of the Mishkan will indicate Kerubim. And he says, they are the seraphim standing above it, which are seen by the prophets. So, 
how can they be Caribbean and Seraphim at the same time? It might be a transition in role. What exactly are they supposed to be doing at any one time? Caribbean, obviously they're, they're close to the presence. They're also guards, if we look at the garden. But the Seraphim have a fiery manifestation. So they might be an entirely separate being, or they might be the Caribbean in a different role, a heavenly being in a different role. Um, but it's saying when you look at the Mishkan, you're supposed to see the Caribbean, and you do because they're woven into the veil. But then he says, it's also the seraphim standing above it, which are seen by the prophet. Who are these seraphim? Because, which you didn't hear last night's lesson, but it, when John is seeing what he sees, he says, this is an angelic measure, right? Which was significant. Um, and again, going back to the boards, they're supposed to represent something. Did I skip it? Okay. Um, but the Midrash Rabbah to Exodus 26.30 says, When the Holy One, blessed be he, commanded Moshe, make me a Mishkan, Moshe might simply have put up four poles and spread out the Mishkan over them. That would have been a Mishkan. However, we learn that the Holy One, blessed be he, showed Moshe on high, red fire, green fire, black fire, and white fire, and said to him, make it in this fashion, which you have been shown on the mountain. So this is something that Moshe saw on Mount Sinai, or Chorev. Now we don't know if they mean he saw it at the giving of the Torah, which I would say yes, or if he actually had seen it previously in the burning bush, which I would also say yes. Because remember, the sign is going to be you're going to come back and, and do something here at an appointed time. And, you know, if you, an all evangelical Christian, one thing you're going to say about Pentecost is people got the Holy Ghost and fire, right? Well, that's exactly what we're talking about, the spirit of Adonai and its fires that Ezekiel went into great detail to describe these fires. Even though he's not giving us colors, he's saying things like, well, the spirit's like a rainbow and so forth. The chashmal, it's different from the ish. Um, but if you wanted to go back and read Bamidbar Rabbah, you know, I don't know if it will help you or not, but I've tried to put it into a nutshell, <clears throat> like into a sentence to describe what he's talking about back here with this red fire, green fire, black fire, white fire. In a nutshell, what Bamid Bar Rabbah says is that when Moses brought the natural dyes that he was commanded to bring for the Mishkan, that the glory of Elohim, like Ezekiel's talking about, was mixed with the natural dye. And then it became the blue, the purple, the scarlet, and the fine linen of the Mishkan. And so Moses would have seen the seraphim standing above as well. If he saw the heavenly Mikdash, the heavenly Mishkan, then he would have seen the acacia boards standing upright. And that's why the expression becomes significant. It's uh, the expression used here, he says, is not set up, ha'amed, but standing up, omdim. All right, so it's not like Moses had to set up the boards, it's that the boards had to stand up. It's, it's a small difference, but it's significant because if it's representation of beings close to the throne, then they need to stand up. They need to resemble the seraphim. Remember, um, if you've ever prayed, like say the mincha, if you've done the dusha, uh, what you do is as you're reciting that kadosh, 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 holy, 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 like the seraphim, 
that's actually verbatim out of the scripture. As you say, kadosh, 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 you actually stand up on your tiptoes. And that is to remind you of the seraphim and that action of the seraphim when they would say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. How did the earth become filled with his glory? By working in people, by working in the Mishkan so that his presence could dwell among the builders of the Mishkan so that they could stand up and guard it, so that they could service it. And in that manner, he's taking the natural product like the dyes, He's mixing it with his own glory. And then we become that light to the world that he called us to be. Uh, Torah Hamincha, Drasha 26, says, Our rabbis taught that Moshe was shown above red fire, green fire, black fire, and white fire. From all this, we learn that the Mishkan and its utensils are in the form of the upper chariot, the Merkava that Ezekiel would have seen, that Isaiah would have seen, that John would have seen. So what does Jewish tradition give us? When we look at the Mishkan, it's going to represent that heavenly chariot or Merkava. It's a type of a vehicle for us to be spiritually elevated on earth. That's when you do the little tippy-toe prayer. Kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy. And remember two things about the garden serve, learn holiness, and to guard, guard the garden. But it's like the spirit of the living beings. It's movable. It can go wherever the spirit needs to go, right? Now, I'm going to show you in Revelation to see, you can see how this works. John is having his revelation, and in the same way that Moses is going to Tetzaveh, the Israelites to bring the olive oil, John's revelation opens with the image of the seven branched menorah, which it says are the seven assemblies. It's going to represent Passover, unleavened bread, and so forth. So they're also being given a commandment, basically straighten up this lampstand, Israel, because if you don't, he says, I'll break off your branch. In other words, I'll destroy your physical body, which is supposed to be a vessel for my light. So John is seeing pretty much the same thing. And this is from Revelation 6, 1 through 8. It says, uh, Then I saw when the Lamb broke one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, now we're back to the chayot or the chaya, saying, as with the voice of thunder, Come, there's a commandment. I looked and behold a white horse and he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer. So there's our white fire. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, Bo. And another, a red horse went out. And to him who sat on it, it was granted to take peace from the earth and that men would slay one another. And a great sword was given to him. Sword in Hebrew is cherev. It's the same root word as chorev. It means to, to be dry, to be thirsty, to be desolate. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Bo. I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius and do not damage the oil and the wine. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Bo, I looked and behold an ashen horse. In Greek, that's going to be chloros, which means yellowish green. So, which that should kind of remind you of those yellow flying serpents down in the Negev that would attack. An ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name Death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine 
and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. So the four altar judgments that Moses teaches to the Israelites, John is again saying, these four altar judgments, these are coming from the realm of death. These are coming from the fourth branch of the menorah, basically. Wild beast, wild beast. Right? Chaya, chayot. It's the spirit of Adonai. So let's see. That might be a good place to stop. I think so. Because we'll do a little bit more with this uh, next week. We'll take this Merkava concept and then my plan is, unless I see something different, is to take last week and this week and then look at the Mishkan as a recreation. That the commandments of the Mishkan, we can look at the parallels in the Mishkan and its service and we can line them up parallel with the commandments of Genesis 1 in the creation. And, and just keep taking it one step forward. <laughs>